you, Jessica and Molly and Carnegie Libraries of Pittsburgh. Um, this is a continuation of a discussion that we started last week about the effect of social media. Last week, we talked mostly about the politics of social media. And the big takeaway, I guess, to condense an hour long presentation to like 10 seconds, I guess you either saw the original one or not, watch it on YouTube, et cetera. The big takeaway is essentially this, social media tends to push people into filter bubbles, we said. What that is, it breaks us into these little self-reinforcing communities where we don't have to hear about things that we don't like. And the result of that is that social media exposure tends to confirm people's own beliefs. Whatever you believed before, you're likely to see more and more of it because you choose your own friends, you choose the media that you're exposed to, and as a result, we tend to have this kind of self-replicating media exposure, a filter bubble. And in a way that makes interpersonal relationships hard as well. If you're a huge nerd like me, you might say that that puts us in different epistemic communities, which all that means is that we literally don't know the same things. The people aren't exposed to the same information and because you choose what you're exposed to, social media tends to have an effect that amplifies confirmation bias, meaning that you tend to believe more and more what you already believed and have very little exposure to things that are outside that bubble, with some exceptions, you know, family who have different beliefs than you do and so on and so forth. Um, but that is a lot of what we talked about. What we're going to talk about today is the effect that social media has on individuals, both in the way that it's designed and how it's designed to um, farm attention, essentially, but also the a little bit, we'll talk about the health effects and some of the um, kind of psychological effect of exposure to social media or constant exposure to it anyway. Um, and the reason that we're doing that is twofold. One is that before the pandemic, we were already on social media a lot, a lot. In fact, there aren't really good statistics available yet about how much time people spent on social media during the pandemic and what it did to their exposure. The preliminary stuff that I've seen suggests that people spent a lot more time on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, that kind of thing during the lockdown than they did previously, which makes sense sort of intuitively, although the numbers are unclear. But there's been a lot of discussion about increasing exposure to Zoom, which we're all doing right now, except for those of you who are on Facebook, welcome our Facebook friends. Um, but that seems to be correct. The thing is that we say, oh, well, everyone spent a lot of time on social media during the pandemic, and that risks missing the fact that we spent a lot of time on social media before the pandemic as well. And we probably won't go back anytime soon. Part of the dynamic of social media, part of the way that it works is to make it more and more difficult to transition away from it once we've started. And that's <laughs> precisely the effect that we're going to talk about today. But this discussion isn't really social media bad or even social media is bad because of COVID and the lockdown and so on. The picture is more complicated than that. The documentary that's tied into this uh, series of presentations or these two presentations, which some of you have probably already seen the social dilemma, tends to have a pretty one-sided view of social media. It focuses on the dangerous political effects of it and the dangerous individual effects of it. I'm not saying that those things are wrong, but uh, we will talk about some of the benefits as well. The, you know, especially during the pandemic, uh, social media helped to spread health information to a lot of people, especially in countries outside the United States where that information was less accessible. It gave people outlets to talk to each other and connect and so on. Um, there are some preliminary studies, like a couple that were done in China, for example, that suggest that people's health information quality was improved early in the pandemic by exposure to social media and the option to get um, relatively unbiased information very quickly. However, that started to change as the pandemic went on and the quality of that information dropped significantly as conspiracy theories and things like that started to push out good information with bad, a kind of Gresham's law of media, which we talked about last week and we won't go over it a lot again today. But even these studies that suggest that social media had a positive effect during the pandemic or other ones that suggest that social media might have positive effects in connecting people or uh, keeping people socially engaged, most of those studies still caution against overuse. 
And social media, regardless of whether it's good or bad for individuals, tends to accelerate the amount of information that you're exposed to, which makes it difficult to filter out what's good and what's helpful from what's bad. Even if social media is mostly good for you and it makes you the happiest person on earth, it probably doesn't, by the way, and statistically that would be an impressive anomaly. But even if it did, that doesn't mean that there aren't also negative social effects and individual effects that exist at the same time. There are downsides, even if there are also upsides to social media use. And we'll spend most of our time talking about those downsides, but it's important to acknowledge that it's not the only thing. The question here isn't really do the benefits outweigh the costs, which is something that can't really be resolved for every social media user generally. The question that we'll talk about towards the end really is how do we maximize the benefits and minimize the deficits of this kind of technology, since we probably aren't going to abolish Facebook anytime soon or get rid of Twitter. The key problem is this, social media breeds dependence and exhaustion at the same time. Even if you're not dependent on it for news or for regular exposure of social relationships, people tend to use it more and more. And we don't really know because the technology is fairly new what constitutes the right amount of time to be exposed to social media. Over time, it tends to do both of those things. And from big studies, big high quality studies on huge groups of people in the United States and abroad, these two effects keep showing up that people become more and more dependent, at least for some things on social media, and they become exhausted by it uh, at the same time, which kind of makes sense because the more dependent you are, it becomes harder to use the technology only when you want to, or only when it seems fun. Instead, you're sort of roped into it. I, uh, I have a Facebook account, so although I don't use it regularly, I haven't logged into it except to respond to like direct things that people say to me in a very long time. So I essentially never use Facebook. When I did, I hated it. I used it for years and I mostly used it because I had to professionally due to my job. I had to stay in contact with hundreds of people who I wouldn't have any other means to sort of regularly monitor. And <laughs> that was important for the kind of work that I was doing at the time. Digital marketing um, websites are really the only data we have about how many people use social media across the board. You can count up Facebook users and Twitter users and so on, but those things overlap a fair amount. But the best digital marketing data that I could mine anyway, suggests that there are about 4 billion social media users, daily users worldwide, with Americans using on average about two hours of social media exposure every day. So if you're awake for 16 hours, that means that 13%-ish of your life is spent on social media on average. However, remember that there are some people who don't use it uh, much at all. And uh, a lot of people who have those accounts, they're relatively inactive, especially some age demographics are a lot more or less active than others. So two hours on average probably conceals quite a bit more use for most of the people who regularly use social media. But even if it didn't, two hours is a lot. And keep in mind that that information is from before the pandemic affected the amount of time that people spend online. Most indicators suggest it's probably much higher right now. The other problem with guessing how much people are actually exposed to social media is that almost all of these numbers come from self-reporting. The companies themselves don't really release high quality data very frequently. Um, that, and they don't release data obviously across the board, only about themselves, which makes it difficult to guess how much time people are really using social media. So most of the numbers come from self-reporting. The problem with that is that we are terrible judges <laughs> of how much time that we spend on social media, or at least we're bad reporters of it, I should say. Um, people tend to either overestimate or underestimate by enormous margins. And the difference is really significant because from, a, I've read a ton of these studies, although I can't say that I've read every one of them, obviously. But the groups that tend to uh, overestimate the amount of time they spend on social media are adolescents and people with trait neuroticism. People, and those are two groups that are disproportionately affected by the negative aspects of social media. And this is what that means. 
people over report how much time they spend who are more profoundly negatively affected by social media, which suggests that negative effects probably happen with less exposure than we thought. But regardless of whether, you know, the number, how accurate the numbers are, one thing that is pretty evident is that we spend a, a god awful amount of time on, on Twitter and Facebook, et cetera. So why does that matter? To answer that question, I'm going to talk a little bit about Las Vegas um, and gambling. Natasha Schull wrote a book in 2012 called Addiction by Design that I read years ago on the recommendation of a professor who was my dissertation advisor, who's now the um, director of the McLuhan Center for Media Studies at the University of Toronto. And this book by Schull studies the way that gambling technologies have changed over time. It used to be that most gambling was what she calls and what gamblers used to call social gambling, meaning that people would be sitting around a card table, for example, or a roulette wheel. Over time, they shifted more and more to machines where people gamble essentially alone. If you were to remake Casino Royale today, Mr. Bond would be sitting in front of a slot machine for 20 hours wearing a diaper, probably. And I'm serious about the diaper thing, by the way. As the technology has changed and people have shifted from social gambling to gambling that's more automated, um, casino workers report things like that all the time. People wearing diapers in the casino, people who stay at a slot machine for 48 hours or more. There's a surprising number of deaths where people stay and literally stay in the stool at the slot machine until they die. Um, that happens more than one might think. But why? It's not an accident that this occurs. It's part of the change of the technology. The goal in designing gambling technology is to make sure that people continue to play. It's not necessarily to make sure that they win a lot because for the technology to be worthwhile, obviously any game that you play against the house, you will over time statistically, you'll lose more than you gain or else they wouldn't offer those games. But um, if you win a fair amount, then that means that it costs the casino money, that they don't make as much money off of you as they would if you won less frequently. But how do you keep someone playing if they don't win all that much? The answer to that is found in the design of the machines themselves. There's a mechanical rhythm to slot machines, for example. <coughs> Excuse me, and video poker as well sort of replicates the same thing. And that, that's what Shull calls the machine zone. If you watch people in a casino, my brother used to, used to drive a tour bus to a casino in Northern Michigan and reported seeing this all the time. You'd see people in this sort of rhythmic, constantly repeated motion. And that is part of the draw of gambling. It's not just the winning, it's the sort of goal that the player sets for themselves to continue to keep playing, which matters more than whether they win or not for a lot of players, especially people who play slot machines and other like obviously statistically poorly calculated games from the player's perspective. Uh, one of the reasons I like this so much is that I used to play cards a lot. I was a semi-professional poker player for a little while. Um, and I still do, and I play online now because that's where most people play. If you use uh, software like PokerStars, which is now legal in Pennsylvania, you get to play cards anytime you want to uh, from anywhere with a group of people who you don't know. It's a depersonalized experience. In other words, if you play really high stakes games, you have to learn about the other players to some degree, but you know, if you don't, then you really don't. You're interacting with a bunch of people who aren't truly real to you. And you can see this in the effects of emotional regulation. If you play in casinos a lot, which I used to do, people tend to be relatively polite to one another, or at least not hostile. You wouldn't believe the kind of things <laughs> that they say to each other on Poker Stars, or maybe you would, but emotional regulation is a serious problem. And it usually doesn't happen because someone loses a lot of money. It happens because the outcome is disruptive somehow, that it sort of upsets the flow and expectation of the game and people totally lose it as a result. This idea that people, what they really like is the repetition and flow of the game 
rather than the possibility that they win, although we'll talk about that in a minute, is related to an idea that, that Sigmund Freud developed in the 1920s, in 1920, in fact, in the book Beyond the Pleasure Principle. Freud called this the repetition compulsion. And he analyzed, you can't do this anymore. This is totally unethical for reasons that are about to be clear. But he experimented on his grandson, wouldn't, wouldn't we all, in 1920, who had a toy, uh, a spool, apparently, tied to a string. And the kid would throw the toy out of his crib and pull it back in. And when it was gone, he would say fort. And when he pulled it back, he would say da. And in German, that, this is the way Freud interpreted the noises the kid was making anyway. In German, that means uh, here and gone, da and fort. And, for, and Freud, creative as he was, uh, called this the fort da game. So <laughs> the kid played this game again and again, simulating that the toy was there, the toy was gone. The toy was there, the toy was gone. And as he did this, his mother um, came and went, which the kid couldn't control, being in a crib. So why play this game? If the child enjoyed the toy, why did he keep throwing it out of the crib? And if he didn't enjoy the toy, why did he keep dragging it back? The answer that psychoanalysts drew to, to this question is that what the child enjoys isn't so much the toy itself, the child enjoys the sense of control over the presence and absence of the toy. It's not that the kid wants the toy or doesn't want the toy. It's that the kid wants to control the coming and going of this toy. And Freud related to that, you know, obviously to the kid's mother coming and going, which the child couldn't control and so on and so forth. But that's the repetition compulsion. And you can see it in gambling technology where you repeat endlessly. And what you enjoy is ultimately not really the winning and you certainly don't enjoy the losing. But for most people, they enjoy the repetition of it. They enjoy the constant um, tie to the technology. So how is social media like this gambling technology? You can see it in a number of design features, which are almost certainly deliberate. And you know, a lot of people have, there are a lot of studies and a lot of books that make these direct links. Some of them will be in the materials that uh, we'll provide for you in the reading list. But the bright colors and movement and visual attraction of automated gambling is also present in social media. It's the same kind of setup and in some ways it's kind of similar display choices. There's positive reinforcement in social media with notifications. When you get a notification, that's exciting. You can check and see what it is, even though it's usually useless. And with social media, there's also an element of threat, especially now, like, did I just get canceled? <laughs> you know, you gotta check your notifications. And some people do this compulsively, that they insist on having zero notifications on their phone. They hate the little red bubble. They have to check every time. If you have a Facebook account and you don't log into it for a long time, they'll start sending you emails and telling you that other people are doing things on Facebook, which you know, obviously you should already know intellectually. But those things, those notifications are designed to sort of draw you back into it. These notifications, the occasional update that you actually want to see, this is called an intermittent or variable reward. The reason why they work is that they are unpredictable. It's not that, you know, every hour you're rewarded by social media somehow with a new notification, the way that you are by like, you know, farming your crops in Farmville, which was a thing like 15 years ago or whatever. Instead, you never really know when they're coming. They're variable rewards. And that means that people are constantly attracted to them. They're unpredictable, which means that the good update, the one that's really exciting to you, you never know where it's going to happen on the feed. So you sort of continue scrolling and looking for it. Um, there is some evidence, and I have heard this from insiders as well, who I'm not, uh, who I probably shouldn't name, but you can read this in some of the books that we'll provide, um, specifically a book called The Attention Merchants by Wu, which is on this list. The bubbles at the top of your feed when you're refreshing screens on your phone are fake, or at least almost certainly in most situations, fake. Your phone loads information pretty fast. So why so frequently do you see those three bouncing bubbles? Why do you see them in text messages? Why do you see them when you uh, reload or scroll social media? They work the same way that the spinning of um, the plates on, on uh, automated gambling machines do, if you play slot machines, for example. They attract attention and they prime you for some reward, an unpredictable reward. 
part of that too is the solitary sense of connection that you can develop. So you're alone when you're looking at Facebook or Twitter or whatever generally, but you're also doing some social things. That there's reciprocity through liking. You participate in your friends' lives and so on. Um, at least you feel like you're participating in some way. And you're also competing against them as well. You have like a cuter boyfriend or girlfriend, you have better shoes or you have a better job and so on. And all of those things you can sort of aggressively, semi-aggressively, secretly aggressively post on social media. Uh, my students claim, because I teach media studies classes and obviously I mine them for constant data. Uh, my students claim that they very frequently make posts on Instagram or Facebook, and if people, if not enough people like their posts, they delete them because they don't want people to see that they said something that everybody wasn't super jazzed about. So they curate their own posts for the image of popularity on social media. It's social in a sense, you get social rewards by the reciprocity of liking and following and so on, but you can do it alone, much the same way that you can gamble alone on a machine. There's also infinite scrolling, which is part of this attraction and part of the similarity too. You'll notice that some services, uh, Pinterest is particularly good at this actually, but probably everybody does it to some degree. If you're scrolling on your phone or on your computer and looking at a series of posts, you'll often see images that you can only see part of. You only see the top half. You have to keep going to see the rest. You'll see the beginning of a post that someone has posted. Um, they could, in theory, the display could work where you see one post at a time. So why do you scroll instead of, you know, shift like pages in a book, a book of faces, a Facebook, if you will? The reason why it scrolls is because if you can just see the top of the next post at the bottom, you're incentivized to continue scrolling. Or the, you know, you can see part of an image on Pinterest, for example, or you can see a bunch of Pinterest images in a Google image search, but you have to join Pinterest to see the whole account and so on and so forth. That kind of, replicates the pull to refresh function of a slot machine and that there's always a little bit more. This is, this is what the kids these days call doom scrolling, <laughs> that even when it's not really rewarding, you continue to do it, even just to read the bad news. People do this in natural disasters all the time. And people did it during the pandemic a lot, which is when the term really became popular. It's the repetition compulsion again. What you, the fact that you'll continue to read more and more things that make you angry or make you jealous or whatever, um, but you do it anyway, is evidence of the repetition compulsion. That's precisely what it is. It's the, it's the repetition that matters, not the content. Ken Hillis, who's another old professor of mine to be, you know, I guess, disclose this conflict here. Ken Hillis wrote a book called uh, Online a lot of the time, a long time ago. This is an old book now but Ken really hit the nail on the head with his description of social media. He described it as a ritual, saying that it feels real. And what matters is the feeling that it is real. He even said that there's some kind of worshipful elements to it in a way. He wrote a later book after online a lot of the time uh, called Google and the Culture of Search, where he collected all this data and talked to all these people about how they use Google. And a surprising number of people will do things like Google, what should I do today? Or what should my username be? Or certainly recommendations for media and things like that. In other words, they treat Google as having a kind of oracular function beyond just the provision of information, that it's something that can tell you what to do. And that's rewarding, certainly. So some of those things replicate gambling, as I mentioned, or you know, the automated technology of gambling machines. And they almost certainly borrow from that technology deliberately. They're designed to maintain your constant attention. But in some ways, these are even worse. Social media combines positive reinforcement with negative reinforcement, meaning that because it has this social aspect to it, if that's your thing, missing something could matter. That there may be partly a drive to just not miss anything, even if you don't particularly want to um, keep engaged. So if you remember from the very beginning of this talk, when I mentioned the link between dependence and exhaustion, this is precisely what it is. The repetition compulsion explains this kind of combination, or is one way to describe this kind of combination between dependence, the constant use of this technology, and exhaustion. Even when you're tired of it, even when you know that you would like to do it less and so on and so forth. 
for the most part, people continue to do it. And as I mentioned last week, this is how the attention economy works. It's not an accident. It is the business model. In gambling, it's the gambler who gives the house money. It's essentially them paying to play. If you play slot machines, you continue to feed money into the machine electronically now, um, and you get to play in return. That's the exchange that you make. On social media though, it's advertisers and people who want your data, who are the ones who benefit from the situation. And you, for the most part, aren't paying the way that you would if you were gambling, for example. This is because you aren't the workers. You aren't the ones who are producing anything in particular. So it's not like you're running the social media companies and you're not getting paid and you're not the consumer really because the system isn't designed for you. The money that social media companies get isn't from their users for the most part. It's from selling the data that their users generate to other parties and from uh, selling advertising as well. In fact, tailoring advertising to be extremely segment specific, which is something that we talked about last week in hyper segmentation. To use an analogy that you might not love, <laughs> you aren't like someone working in a slaughterhouse. You're more the cows <laughs> in the slaughterhouse who are being slaughtered and then you're sold for meat or milk if that's a little too grim for you. In any case, social media isn't for you. <laughs> you aren't the intended consumer. You are the product. You're like crops. You're essentially Ben Rogers. Do you know who Ben Rogers is? Do you remember him? You probably don't because he's not famous. Tom Sawyer is famous. Ben Rogers is just the kid who Tom Sawyer tricked into painting the fence for him. That's more or less who you are. You're Ben Rogers, you don't get a Rush song. By the way, once you've decided to paint the fence, it only gets worse because the longer that you spend on social media, the more data is collected about you. And the more data that companies have about you, the more they can target their approaches to you, the more effective advertising is, the more valuable the data that they mine out of you. Um, becomes. And there's a bunch of stuff written about that, which means that, that dependence is an important goal because dependence means information and information is the valuable product that's produced um, by social media. Not valuable to you necessarily because you don't matter. Your crops, your cattle, that's the point. Something is being extracted from you that is sold to someone else. You are just the unfortunate thing that is incidental to this transaction. Uh, this, by the way, this is dramatized in The Social Dilemma in the scene with Vincent Carthiser, who Pete Campbell from Mad Men. It's the scene of him playing three different AIs, trying to convince someone to use social media more by activating different elements of their psyche and so on and so forth. So there might be a lot of bad effects that come from this. And you sort of expect that in a way because, again, the point of the product isn't really to benefit you. The point is to extract something out of you that benefits the company. I assume I've got a lot of uh, fourth century monk fans out there. John of, John of Cassian, anyone? He developed the, the idea of the seven deadly sins. There were eight originally. We're not going to talk about being glory today. Uh, seven deadly sins. So let's talk about that in relationship to social media very briefly. Think of it. All, all seven of them are part of the effect and reward and operation of social media. There's pride. You get to boast about stuff on social media, how cool you are, all the great things that you've done, uh, so on and so forth. There's anger. Remember, we talked about this above a little bit, but it's also like every thread ever. There's like death threats over people's music preferences, and so on and so forth. Social media is a place of totally unbridled viciousness sometimes. YouTube's comment sections, when historians are writing the you know, book about the decline and destruction of our civilization someday, most of it will be about the YouTube comment sections, I imagine. There's vanity, you know, the good old like, oh, hello, I didn't see you there taking my picture, etc. This is like all that Instagram really is. People curate their images, they 
uh, are vain about their appearance and so on and so forth. And they get an opportunity to do that in a semi-public display, but one that they can control access to carefully, which is the promise of social media. There's greed. How many times have you seen someone like essentially make a post that amounts to, I have a lot of money one way or another. I'm on a boat. My bag costs a lot. My shoes are expensive, so on and so forth. I can do all these things that you can't. All that stuff could be described as greed. There's a uh, Akedia or sloth, which is probably the dependence of social media, doom scrolling, where you say just one more minute online, just one more post, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you procrastinate, spend more time on social media or multitask and do everything that you're doing worse. And you're away from people while you do it a little bit. Um, there's envy. There's a lot of good studies on this, for example, the way that social media encourages people to have FOMO, the fear of missing out, or to uh, be angry even about the things that other people have that they wish that they had. Uh, it's a sort of well-documented result of this exposure. And finally, there's gluttony, which is more than just like, look at my Instagram pasta, but it's also the way that we consume the media itself is intemperate at the wrong times, too much, so on and so forth. So maybe you don't think all these things are bad, which is fair enough. Al Pacino is pretty convincing at the end of Devil's Advocate, um, especially when he's standing next to Keanu Reeves. The point here is that not so much that these are the evils of social media, but these are the built-in features of it that guarantee that it works. They explain the appeal of the systems. Social media isn't so much about linking people together or like sharing good recipes or talking to the grandkids or whatever. All of those things are possible, but those things don't produce the kind of constant addictive overuse that makes the technology economically valuable. It takes more than that. And the explanations we've given so far are part of it. You are, in a certain way, prodding other people to do the same thing as well. If you're a Rick and Morty fan, maybe I'm the only one, but you know, this you are a part of Rick's battery. <laughs> Everybody is working for each other, but really they're working to produce something that's used by someone else, the people who are running the little simulation. I always think, I don't know why, animal ethology is a kind of side interest of mine, I suppose. I remember reading the story about an elephant once that knew its name. So the keeper, and it knew the names of all the other elephants in the zoo, in its little herd. So when the keepers wanted a particular elephant, they would call out that elephant's name. And this elephant, this snitch elephant that knew everybody's name, would go and get the elephant that they were calling and make that elephant come to the keepers. It was like a trustee in, in prison, basically, an elephant prison, which is <laughs> the zoo. That's sort of what you're doing by constantly producing stuff that is the content that other people want. Facebook can rely on you or Twitter or Instagram or whoever. I keep saying Facebook because we're live streaming on Facebook and I think that's funny, but obviously this applies to everything. Facebook can rely on you to produce the stuff that drags everybody else in to the successive use of the technology that mines information and makes money for them, but has sort of questionable benefits for you. All of this stuff, and there's a lot of research on this, but this kind of dynamic of uh, dependence and exhaustion is pretty closely related to depression and low self-esteem, general misery. It has all the problems of addiction in general as well, that poor academic and work performance can be documented pretty closely from heavy social media use, worse family relationships, even health effects like poor diet, less exercise, more tobacco and alcohol, suicide, social isolation, all these things are correlated with higher social media use. It's difficult to describe them as causally connected. The experiments that would have to be done for that are you know, pretty large, um, but the evidence is, exists that there's at least a strong correlation. And there's a stronger causative argument as well for declines in cognitive performance and attention, which can be documented the more that you use social media, which I mean, decline of cognitive performance and attention sort of makes you a better social media user in some ways from the company's perspective. So all of that stuff makes sense. So are you, you feeling pretty good about this so far? Uh, it's it's going to get worse. We're going to talk about your phone now. We have to talk about your phone. I'm sorry. There's a 2011 novel by Max Berry called Machine Man. And in this novel, an engineer forgets his phone at home one day 
And he's so distracted by having left his phone at home, like constantly checking his pocket for it and thinking about it and so on. He's so distracted that he loses a leg in an accident. And gradually, in the name of efficiency, he ends up replacing his whole body with mechanical parts when he realizes that the prosthetics are in some ways better than his original body. There's a lot of other stuff going on in this book, like commentary about disability, but let's start at the beginning. The key part of this book is that his phone is so connected to him in a way that it is part of his body. It's an extension of himself, and it's even more significant in some ways than his actual body to him. The convenience and power of the technology is what ultimately matters. Uh, Max Berry wrote another book, by the way, called Lexicon, which is about persuasion and isn't about social media, but is great and sort of includes a lot of the lessons that I've already mentioned. Anyway, do you ever feel like that? Have you ever forgot your phone somewhere? and freaked out about it or constantly checked your pocket for it or felt incomplete. A lot of people say that they have uh, the phantom sense of vibration in their pocket, even when they forget their phone, a little bit like phantom limb when people lose a limb. It's hard to forget about it. Why? The average person who has a smartphone interacts with their phone which means clicking or swiping or whatever, any interaction. The average person interacts with their phone 2,600 times every day. 2,600 times. And you get constant reminders that you're supposed to do that. Every app wants you to uh, enable alerts, for example. You get ringtones like when your phone actually rings uh if you're like a millennial or a zoomer or something that probably never happens but you know you get the idea it vibrates in your pocket it's all this constant bothering you to get you to check your phone it's part of the attention economy it's built on the same principles that social media in general is built on and that are adapted from gambling machines for example it's one of the reasons why some social media applications like twitter are exclusive or almost exclusive to phones because phones are the ideal platform for them. You've always got it with you. They can annoy you constantly to check it, and most people do. Oh, and people check their phones even when there's no alert, by the way. It's not like the phone has to make you do it. On average, again, from a fairly extensive study that I read, people who have smartphones compulsively check their phones about every 12 minutes. Meaning that if nothing is happening, you'll still check your phone at least five times an hour. And that's the average. That makes people miserable too, in some ways. It constantly distracts. It has negative effects on attention. And it encourages people to multitask as well. Most people think that they're good at multitasking. And almost everybody is wrong about that. There's overwhelming evidence in this regard that multitasking makes you worse at both things that you're doing. and often means that you spend more time total doing two things than you would if you just did them in succession. Everybody thinks they're good at multitasking, which is a good example of the Dunning-Kruger effect, if you know what that is. In other words, people who are bad at something tend to overestimate how good they are at it because they, they literally don't know enough about it to know how bad they are at it. That's why everyone thinks that they're good at multitasking. It's why everybody thinks that they're an above average driver, even though that's statistically impossible. Driving is not incidental to this, by the way. People check their phones so frequently and interact with the technology so compulsively that right now, at this second, according to DOT estimates, 660,000 people are driving and texting at the same time. At any given time, it's about 660,000 people. About a quarter of all car accidents result from people uh, texting or checking social media on their phones, which means that uh, about 5,000 people are killed every year in fatal car accidents due to the use of their smartphones, the sort of compulsive attention grabbing effect of the technology. That shouldn't really be a surprise if you think about it. If you're distracted from, for five seconds and you're driving at 55 miles per hour, that means that you're distracted while you drive roughly 100 yards, the length of a football field. Just five seconds, and that's it. Kills a ton, a ton of people. And it mimics a lot of the behavior that you find from uh, gambling machines and from social media in general. Remember that machine zone that we talked about before? 
where people sort of fall into the rhythm, their own little world of playing slots. The exact same thing happens on people's phones. If you, if you don't do this, you do probably, by the way. But if you don't do this, just observe people walking sometimes. How many people in groups? There's always one person walking much slower than everybody else who's playing with their phone or checking you know, their email or whatever, rather than doing it literally 90 seconds later. This is part of the kind of compulsive machine repetition that exists from the technology. And you probably don't even think about it. Wendy Chun, uh, who wrote a book called Updating to Remain the Same. Uh, Chun argues that a key horizon for technology, uh, your phone is an example of this, social media is another example of this, a key horizon for the technology isn't really when it becomes obsolete necessarily. So you can think like MySpace or Second Life or whatever, or social media platforms that are basically dead now. The key thing for the growth of a technology is when it becomes both habitual and invisible. In other words, you become like the engineer in Machine Man who doesn't really notice his phone except when it's gone. It's habit and it's invisible to you most of the time. This is the way that a lot of our technology works, in fact. Like, are you thinking about your light bulbs right now? You probably aren't, but if one of them went out, then you'd notice. You notice their absence for the most part, but not their presence. You live in an environment that's gradually adapted more and more so that it's synthetic and artificial elements become the background. They become part of the ecology, not something that you have to particularly pay attention to. And that's the way that uh, your phone sort of attracts you into murdering a bunch of people every year. 5,000 people a year, by the way, is, is more than the total casualties of the United States and Iraq since 2003, just to put that in perspective. But anyway, it's that sort of invisible background that makes the technology so pernicious. Your phone is an example of it, but social media is maybe the kind of ultimate perfection of it because it works across platforms and it works in a way that compels constant attention without appearing to compel constant attention. Hence, it breeds dependence and exhaustion at the same time. So, what can you do about all of this? In short, probably not much. And the, re the reason that you can't do a lot about the situation is that um, it's that you're, you're dumb. And I'm also dumb and your friends are dumb and your neighbors are dumb and Albert Einstein was dumb, everybody's dumb. That's why we can't do anything about it. I, I feel like this deserves a little bit more explanation. If you remember last week, we talked about this book by Mercier and Sperber called The Enigma of Reason. And I had this example about monkeys and the red berries. I'm gonna <laughs> briefly repeat that because it's important here. We aren't really designed cognitively to assess information very well, to draw the right conclusions from information that we're exposed to in the world. What we're really good at is convincing other people that we're good at doing this, that we're good at drawing conclusions. We're wired in a way for persuasion, not really for information processing. This is where I'll make another plug for Barry's novel lexicon, by the way, since it's all about persuasion. If you're a monkey and you find a red berry, the red berry is either food or poison. Let's say that it might kill you, but it might be you know, food for your entire little monkey band. If you eat the berry, there's a chance that you die and there's a chance that you have found a new food source. If you convince another monkey to eat the berry, then there's a chance that, that monkey dies, but there's no chance that you die. <laughs> and you can still claim credit for finding the food source. In other words, what we're really good at is convincing other people to adopt some of the risk that comes along with processing um, and just the effort as well. It's, it pays off more to be persuasive to persuade yourself in some ways and to persuade other people, because that's what you're constantly doing. You, you, you have all these beliefs, opinions, attitudes towards the world that you can't prove objectively, um, and you don't really have to. They're provisional theories for now. And those theories work the best when other people have to, have to bear the costs for them. But as a result, we're really designed in some ways, I, I should say evolved, sorry, I didn't mean to be as contrary. 
we're evolved. <laughs> we're evolved to process uh, information secondarily and to convince people primarily. That's the reason why it's really hard to overcome social media. Why? You have roughly three pounds of wrinkly meat stuck inside your skull. Its design is millions of years old, and a lot of it is probably full of like sports trivia and facts about the Kardashians or whatever. And that thing, it's supposed to manage everything that you do all the time. That's you. That's what you've got. Three pounds of wrinkly meat, mostly Kardashians. What have they got? The social media companies. They've got a trillion dollar industry with massive adaptive algorithms designed by some of the smartest people in the world and actually designed by machines who constantly improve the algorithms such that no one on earth really totally understands how they work. And all those algorithms really try to do is figure out how to addict you to something that you are already evolved to want, the social interaction that social media provides for you. You, three pounds a million year old meat, them, trillions of dollars of constantly evolving technology that's networked and designed by thousands and thousands of people and machines that you don't understand. Does that seem fair? Probably not. And this is a lesson that you can also see in the social dilemma. But you shouldn't feel too bad <laughs> about this situation. For one thing, as a lot of technology industry commentators were, were quick to say about the documentary about the social dilemma, it focuses on the bad parts of technology, but there are good ones as well that we mentioned in the very beginning, or at least complicated applications and results of it. Like its potential to affect politics is sometimes bad, which we talked about last week, but maybe also potentially you know, good or at least co-optable for those ends. For you as an individual, which is what we're focusing on today, might help you access information very quickly. For example, if you belong to a community that's otherwise marginalized, like a religious or gender or sexual or ethnic community, that's isolated where you live, social media can be really helpful for you to find connections with people who you wouldn't otherwise meet. Same thing with your phone. Is your phone bad, given the way I've described it earlier? Not if you're lost. <laughs> In that case, your phone's great. Not if you like books, for example. Like, if you ride the bus a lot, which I do, it's nice to think, I wish I could read this book, and literally two seconds later, it exists. It's on my phone. I can read it. Those things are positive applications for sure. So there's counter examples to all the studies that I've mentioned before, and we don't know a ton about the conclusions. However, the best evidence tends to tend fairly strongly negative. But again, this is a new experiment. So the way that we use social media is one way to take a conclusion from this. The way that we use social media tends to be corruptive in some ways. It damages our attention. It might have negative social effects. It certainly makes us worse at a lot of things that we would otherwise do. And it often makes us feel badly about ourselves and others as well. But that doesn't mean that the technology doesn't have some upside that we could maybe maximize as we minimize other elements of it. So how would we minimize some of the downsides of it so we can focus on the things that are valuable? There's not a ton of solutions in the social dilemma. Jaron Lanier, Jaron Lanier, I'm sorry, I said that too quickly, I think, uh, who is in the documentary, wrote a book called 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now, which is good. It's worth reading. And that is, that, that is an option that most certainly will limit your exposure to social media were you to delete all of your accounts. It's also possible that like Congress could legislate all of this away. I'm kidding, that's, that's theoretically possible, but it's not gonna happen. So it's mostly up to you, but you aren't powerless in this situation. What follows are a couple of tips about minimization of bad stuff and maximization of good stuff, which research has supported some of them and some of them it hasn't, but I think are worth thinking about anyway. One thing is to start by asking yourself, if you feel like you use social media too much, why do I do this? What I mean is to pose that question and really think about what the answer is. What about this technology and its platform makes you happy, if anything? If you can't answer that question, nothing about it makes you particularly happy. 
then that may help in reframing the way that you think about your relation to that technology. If your answer is something very specific, like I need this for professional networking, for example, it may change how you use the technology, even if you continue to use it. So LinkedIn is a social network, for example. However, um, it has hundreds of millions of users. And on average, the average user of LinkedIn spends 17 minutes on LinkedIn per month. If the average user of social media spends two hours on social media per day, then that means that they spend some 600 hours on social media every, no, sorry, 60 hours, <laughs> 60 hours on social media every month. If the average user spends 60 hours on social media every month, and the average LinkedIn user spends 17 minutes on, on LinkedIn every month, if the only reason that you're using social media is for professional connections, that's one way to radically change the amount of time that's necessary for you to do that. If you're an academic, there's academia.edu, which is its own kind of evil, but it's there. It lets you stay in touch with people. Uh, if the answer is something like, I use social media to stay in touch with my family, text them more, call them more, don't do it in your car, but do it. All of those things may help sort of break the dependence that happens from social media and mean that even if you end up using it still, but using it less, it may help to deal with the exhaustion of it as well. Doom scrolling and so on is a lot less attractive when you've broken the cycle for a little while. As you do it less, you become less dependent, which means that the sort of repetition compulsive elements of it are less and less rewarding for you and therefore less compelling. Cut out the things on social media that make you unhappy. Ask yourself to, of the remainder of things that I do on social media, I've identified the things I have to do or the things that make me happy. Of everything else, what makes me miserable or what could I cut out? Do you really need to follow all the celebrities that you follow? Maybe, maybe that's rewarding for you in some way. Everybody likes gossip. Do you really need to follow all the like influencers that you follow? Probably not, or at least not as many of them. If you think hard about your experiences as you have them, it helps you to respond. Think about, do this experiment sometime. If you're gonna spend an hour on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or whatever, as you look at every post, think to yourself, why do I like this or do I like this? What's happening in here that is attractive to me? Be mindful about those experiences, in other words. If you're looking at an account of a bunch of rich people enjoying things that you can't have, does that make you happier? Do you like that, really? Does it have a positive influence on your life? Maybe it does, I'm not your mom. Um, you make these decisions yourself, but maybe it doesn't, in which case you can start to modulate again who you follow and how you use the technology. You can also just think of alternatives. One of the things that makes social media kind of great if you have a short attention span, as I do, is that you constantly have something to do all the time. That's why everybody kills each other with their car because they're playing with their phone. Think of alternatives though that fill that same space. You can read a book on Kindle, which I mentioned before, or you know, any other it's many competitors if you're bored. You can spend your time reading Wikipedia rabbit holes. You'd be surprised how much I know about court etiquette in the 14th century of Byzantium as a result of my poor attention span. You can fall down all these rabbit holes and the rabbits won't insult your body image or try to sell you anything, which is great. You can learn a language on Pittsburgh's own Duolingo, but we're not going to be commercial here. So you could also learn a language on its many competitors. Um, but think about that. It's actually part of the marketing that these companies use. And unfortunately they gamify education and use a lot of the lessons that I mentioned from gambling and stuff earlier, but at least, you know, the goal is for you to be able to swear at people in their native language. Um, and you can also just change the profile that you use. I don't mean like deleting all your personal information, although for sure do that. I mean that you can just follow friends, for example, and limit your use. If you limit your use of social media and just follow friends, there's actually quite a bit of decent evidence that suggests that that resolves a lot of the problems that people have psychologically in their relation to social media. It makes them happier about what they do and makes it all more rewarding for them in the end. So you don't necessarily have to follow Jaron Lanier's advice and delete all of your social media accounts. That's easy for some people and it's hard for others. Sometimes it's difficult to do, especially if 
your job kind of requires you to network in the way that you do, or, uh, you know, like half my family lives in Europe, you know, it's useful for me to be able to talk to them on Facebook instead of have to call them all the time and so on and so forth. So maybe you can't eliminate it all, but you probably don't really have to. You can limit exposure and limit the kinds of exposure you get to weed out the very worst parts of it. So all of those things might help you potentially. Last week, we talked about the content of what you see on social media, um, you know, conspiracy theories and misinformation and things like that some of which is pretty nasty. This week, we talked more about the form of social media. In other words, how the technology works in relation to attention and to addiction by design. And we did cover a lot of stuff, but there's plenty that I had to cut out. And nearly everything I said, uh, whether I said that there's a, well, every time I said, there's a study that proves this, if you're in the humanities, this is like a secret language where you can say there's a study and everybody treats it, you know, as if you've like uncovered some sacred object from the past that no one understands anymore. This time, however, every time I said there's a study, I made sure that there's really a study <laughs> and I've got all the lists of them right here, which we will share with you. But what that means is that there's a ton of information, even though we've covered a lot of ground here quickly that I left out. And if you've got questions, comments, complaints, and we're definitely sticking around for that. So thank you. Thank you, Callum. You do such a great job of sharing really doom and gloom information in a very <laughs> entertaining and educational way. Um, so thank, thank you. you. That was like a roundabout compliment insult that I feel like I just gave you. Um, I appreciate but I, it. I was feverishly uh, adding links into the chat um, but I will consolidate all of those into our reading list. A lot of them we do have in our library catalog, some of them we don't. So I'll make sure that the outline that we email to everybody um, will include that. I'm also going to share a link to our Navigating Information Fatigue page. So if there are people watching on Facebook or um, they just didn't register and they found us anyway, um, you'll be able to see all of the uh, resources and recordings for this series on our website. Um, in addition to the other places we've been in them. I would love to open up for questions either in Facebook land or here on Zoom uh, from what you've heard and learned. And then I also wanted to just share a question that we got after the last program um, to get your thoughts on that because you touched on the social dilemma several times. Um, we got a comment saying, you know, it was great to learn from the people that worked for Google, Facebook, hear their experiences and their concerns, but they found it really disconcerting that those guys never thought for a moment that, you know, as we live in a dual reality, that the internet could be used not just as a tool for, you know, good, but basically for evil. And I think at the end, there was even that point where the, the interviewer asked, like, do your kids go on social media or have accounts? And they were all like, oh, no. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. Um, so their question, but not really question, kind of just like interested in thoughts was, you know, what do we, I don't know. It's like, should they have known better, basically? And we, we can't be in their heads. Uh, sadly, we didn't have the the funds to have the guys from Social Dilemma be on this webinar. But um, do you think that, you know, it was just a matter of they were like young and excited and they got the opportunity to build these platforms and then they didn't really think about the potential fallout, either like safety for children, the vulnerable, things like that. So your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, that's a great thing to think about. And I'm glad that someone mentioned it. It's it's difficult to answer that question in some ways. For one thing, I like don't know these dudes. They were all dudes back in the day who did this pretty much. But it gets to something I talked about last week a little bit that, you know, from, you know, I, I have actually had to read quite a bit about the history of the internet and the way that this stuff was developed at first. When the technology was new, like new, new in the late 80s and early 90s, and all the way through the 1990s until probably roughly, 2001 or so, wherever you decide that web 2.0 or the commercialization of the web really took over. But for at least 10 years, social media was much more limited than it is now. And the internet in general was thought of in a different way. And part of the reason that that's true is because the old paradigm of social control was mostly about 
limiting access to information. And this is what we talked about last week. Totalitarian governments who were falling around the world in the early 1990s, or, you know, they were, they were taking a break as it turned out. But anyway, they were like, you know, taking a time out. They seemed to be doing so because they lost the ability to control information. Soviet citizens suddenly found out what was happening in the rest of the world and so on. Um, you could listen to the radio, you could be exposed to culture from everywhere and so on and so forth, rather than, you know, circulating Samistat written on sheets of paper that you had to smuggle out of prison and so on. So it seemed like what the internet was doing was creating a situation in which governmental control, at least, would be basically impossible because everybody would have access to information everywhere. And there was this kind of utopian liberation narrative that went along with it. Pretty quickly, people realized that that wasn't the case. And part of what Andreevic was writing about in Infoglut, which I mentioned last week, is that social control really works actually probably best when you can overexpose people to information rather than control it. It's much easier to conceal the truth of something. Well, let me put it this way. You don't need to conceal the truth of something. If what you can do is expose everyone to so many different viewpoints about it that they become very unsure as a result. This is the tactic that like tobacco companies developed, for example. They weren't trying to prove that smoking was good for you or that it wasn't bad for you. They were trying to create enough doubt that it muddied the waters and decreased the drive for regulation, for example. I mentioned a book last week that um, includes a discussion of that and how it applied to later things like climate change and acid rain and stuff called Merchants of Doubt by uh, Oreskes and someone else. But Oreskes, Naomi Oreskes is the important one. That seemed to change the narrative, but people, a lot of people didn't really give up on the utopian possibilities of the internet. And the thing that revived them was actually social media. If you remember in 2011 or so, when all these protests broke out in North Africa and the Middle East, they were called Twitter revolutions. The Libyan government collapsed and you know there were uh, revolutions and protests in Egypt and uh, Bahrain and so on and so forth. And the war in Syria started around then as well. There was this brief time again when people thought, oh look, the utopian possibility of the internet, we weren't wrong. It just wasn't what we thought. There's a new way to do this. And this way is that regular citizens will communicate with each other directly through things like Twitter. So you can see in some ways that probably these people, like most people, didn't want to admit that they were wrong. Um, and that there was some evidence, at least credible-ish evidence, that encouraged them to continue having some faith in the technology. Uh, like I said, it does have mixed results. So I'm not trying to defend anyone who developed the technology, but I think the reason why people aren't guilty about it is partly because it's such a complex social phenomenon and it's so new that it's difficult to take full responsibility because there isn't enough kind of historical pause where we can assess the results of all these things. Should those people take more responsibility? Maybe. But, you know, just like nearly every massive kind of corporate controversy that exists, no single individual, it's difficult to identify one individual and say, this is your fault. So it's easy to shift blame and very difficult, I think, to uh, identify oneself with the negative parts of this technology when you have the option of identifying yourself with the positive parts of it, which I think a lot of people have done. So that might be why they're not guilty, but obviously some of them are. A lot of the people on that documentary uh, maybe didn't see it at the time and maybe they should have, but now a lot of the pushback against social media that's most effective comes from people who were involved in developing earlier versions of it. Uh, so similar to that, um, those watching may or may not know that a former political leader of ours uh, was removed from social media and specifically Facebook and the Facebook oversight board gave their their ruling their judgment on this um, and that got to this question which you know what are, what are your thoughts on things like 
the Facebook Oversight Board where, you know, this was created using Facebook funds and at the sort of discretion of Facebook, even though the people on the board are from a pretty wide uh, pool from around the world. Um, is something like this really like, can it be, can it really be unbiased or uh, useful to, to the everyday person? And is this just sort of like Facebook trying to look good? That's an interesting question. Um, well, two things about that. One is that the members of that oversight board some of them do seem, you know, credible and impartial and so on, or at least not financially dependent on it. Like if I remember this correctly, like the former prime minister of Denmark of all people is on this board. Whether the individuals on the board are corrupt or not probably doesn't really matter in the end, unless deplatforming people from Facebook is an effective solution to the problems. And the answer to that second part is almost certainly no. So there's very little evidence, I think. And you know, I, I, it, I'd be happy to be wrong about this if this changes over time. But at this point, there's very little evidence that removing someone from any social media platform removes their ability to communicate with followers um, or to disrupt the ideologies that they represent. So you see this all the time. So incels, for example, involuntary celibates, which is an internet community of uh, people now almost all men, although it didn't start that way, but men who believe that they don't have access to women the way that they imagine. And the, the worst parts of this community are this kind of violent misogynist um, group or set of groups. So they exist almost entirely online and very quickly deplatforming was the main option against them. They were banned from Reddit or a lot of them hung out. Uh, a lot of their forums were closed down and things like that. But they always pop up somewhere else. It's really difficult to deplatform. Part of the problem with deplatforming extremists, and I'm not suggesting that the Trump people are or aren't extremists, but part of the um, difficulty of deplatforming extremists is that most of them have this narrative built in where they expect opposition from the mainstream or from their opponents, the radical left or the radical right, whoever you think is your enemy. When you get removed from public fora, often that reinforces this idea. People feel like, oh, I was right, because look, they are persecuting us. They are trying to censor us and so on and so forth. So you could possibly reduce the number of people who are exposed to those ideologies, although probably you won't, because when you ban someone from Twitter, <laughs> there's like, a bunch of news stories about how you ban them from Twitter and so on and so forth. And they always find somewhere else to go. But even if you could limit access a little bit to those ideologies, you probably aren't doing much in the end because you're confirming the truth of those ideologies to some people who are uh, undecided. So in the end, I think that deplatforming probably will turn out when we have more complete pictures of how it works, will probably turn out to be ineffective at best and, and perhaps even counter uh, counterproductive because it kind of making, because knowledge is so easily accessible now, making some group or some perspective taboo uh, very rarely actually removes it from circulation, but it does make it exciting because it's taboo, which encourages people to seek it out. Like white supremacists, for example, there's a lot of talk about deplatforming white supremacists. And maybe that's important and it sends a social signal and so on. But white supremacy existed in the 60s and 70s and 80s before uh, social media made it easier. It won't go away by eliminating it. Convincing ourselves that it will is, is pretty dangerous. So there's a broader kind of societal change that's necessary to either create consensus about things or to encourage um, healthy opposition, depending on what the ideas are. And eliminating them from some social media platforms probably isn't a particularly helpful element to that, in my judgment. And again, I could be wrong about this because I think that as a strategy, it's new enough that we don't really know whether it'll work. But Trump is a good example of this. So people who thought that removing Trump would break his political holds were almost certainly wrong, as recent events suggest. So I don't think that there's great evidence that this works. 
Okay. Um, so, you know, we did title this webinar, uh, you know, with addiction by design, which is used uh, for a variety of things. But I think it's really important to remember the younger generations that have known nothing else but social media growing up and have been on it from a very young age, maybe even younger than they're allowed to be on social media. Um, and, you know, despite the the fact that it makes them depressed, it makes their self-confidence plummet, it, they can experience bullying. It's like they can't break that addiction. So um, I don't know that there's necessarily a lot to say. I think it's important to just acknowledge that, but I know that you, you've done work um, in your debate hat with um with younger people and I think like the tips that you gave towards the end of what you can do to kind of like uh get away from social media do things that are a little nicer and better for your brain your mental health those are things t I hope our our listeners and viewers are thinking of and um yeah I don't know if there's anything more that you want to say just about the, this younger generation that we did see play out in the social dilemma with um that like family and the, the boy especially well it may you know <laughs> my my natural proclivity is is doom and gloom as you said before i'm not exactly what one would call an optimist but there are reasons to think that the older that the technology gets even as it gets absorbed into the background of life and so on it might not be as pernicious as it is now forever people who are raised with the technology may actually be dependent on it in different ways or may use it in different ways than people who aren't. If you're exposed to it all the time, then it may not have the same appeal. And you may also have more practice in managing its use and dealing with it. As the technology continues, we'll get, excuse me, better and better at responding to it. One, one thing that is worth thinking about is that nearly every new media technology uh, historically has been immediately been faced with opposition. So when novels became popular and affordable, um, like Penny Dreadfuls and things like that in the late Victorian age, people freaked out about that. People, people said the mass availability of like pulp novels will destroy society. Comic books in the 1930s and 40s, people freaked out about how dangerous comic books could be because they're corrupting the youth and so on. People said the same thing about television. They say the same thing about video games and so on and so forth. Every media initially gets a strong pushback. And in the end, you know, over time is that technology becomes mature and as uh, competitors to it arise, for the most part, we look back and realize that we exaggerated some of the dangers. Social media might be a different thing in some ways due to unique aspects like info glut and the solitariness of it and so on and so forth. Um, the way that the algorithms design it to be addictive rather than people, you know, just liking it the way that they like books. But it's too early to be hopeful about those things, but it's also too early to be absolutely pessimistic about them, I think. Okay, last chance for questions. I'm going to also share just one last time the link to our YouTube channel, which has our playlist of navigating information fatigue videos that we are compiling. So going once. All right. Well, thank you all again so much for being here. Uh, I hope you'll take a few minutes to complete our survey and uh, be on the lookout in your email and on our webpage for the reading list, as well as the outline that Callum went through today. Lots of great information and books to peruse. Also, yes, Lexicon is one of my favorite books. So I'm very glad I made the cut today. Um, <laughs> we thank you all so much for joining us and have a great rest of your evening.